there are four major reasons why you could encounter an abnormal opacity in the lung. In this talk, we're going to begin a discussion of consolidation. When it comes to interpreting uh, consolidation on imaging, uh, one way to handle it is to divide it um, according to chronicity and distribution. Uh, acute versus chronic in terms of chronicity and non-diffuse versus diffuse in terms of distribution. Uh, when it comes to non-diffuse, uh, it could be something as one focus of consolidation in one lung, or it could be multiple foci um, in both lungs, but distributed in such a way that it's um, haphazard, meaning there's areas of sparing in between. So um, in terms of the interpretation of consolidation, uh, we're going to find ourselves into one of three situations. Uh, acute non-diffuse consolidation, acute diffuse consolidation, and chronic non-diffuse consolidation. And we'll discuss the approach to each of these three situations. Um, it's very unlikely that you'll encounter chronic diffuse consolidation. It's probably not compatible with life, and so um, that will not uh, be one of the talks. But this talk is going to be focusing on acute non-diffuse consolidation. Uh, one quick note, um, when we're talking about acute versus chronic, we're talking about basically things that are playing out less than or greater than four to eight weeks. Um, sometimes we're going to have um, prior medical imaging to help inform our decisions, and sometimes we won't. Um, we might have to use uh, some hints that we're dealing with a chronic versus an acute process. Architectural distortion tends to bias me towards uh, a chronic versus uh, an acute process, but I'm not always going to be um, accurate in that case. And so it's not unusual sometimes where if it's not quite clear if this is an acute or chronic uh, consolidation, you may have to give a broader differential. Um, differential you're going to learn from this talk and differential you're going to learn from one of the subsequent talks on chronic um, non-diffuse consolidation. But for this talk, we're going to be talking about how to handle acute non-diffuse consolidation. Now, if uh, we had asked um, you in medical school uh, what is your differential diagnosis um, for um, basically uh, patchy, if you will, uh, consolidation um, in the lungs, uh, I think a uh, familiar mantra would have been blood, water, pus, which for acute non-diffuse consolidation uh, interpretation um, as a radiology resident still holds pretty true. Um, we may be a little bit more fancy now. Uh, we'll say alveolar hemorrhage, lung infection, or pulmonary edema, but it still inherently boils down to these three main categories of uh, pathology. However, this being radiology residency now, we're gonna ask you to go a little bit farther and remember three types of lung infection, three types of pulmonary edema situation, three types of alveolar hemorrhage um, situation um, for our differential diagnoses when we see acute non-diffuse consolidation. So let's, let's um, begin the deeper dive, starting with lung infection. Now, when we talk about um, respiratory tract infections, um, not only for this talk, but for future talks, um, most of the organisms, organisms that we're going to encounter and discuss are the ones that you're going to see on this slide here. Now, of all of these different um, organisms here, almost everything can potentially result in acute non-diffuse consolidation. The only things I've taken off the list um, are varicella, Cryptococcus, pneumocystis, and aspergillus. Um, these four are uh, unlikely to result in a consolidative picture, a non-diffuse consolidated picture, um, because after all, pneumocystis can cause consolidation, but uh, diffuse consolidation. So anyways, lots of organisms. So um, let's kind of um, approach this uh, one, I guess, uh, kingdom at a time. I guess it's kingdom. Um, anyways, let's start with um, viral uh, infections. So um, lots and lots of uh, different viruses are out there, all of which um, may be a cause of acute non-diffuse consolidation. But when we talk about viral respiratory tract infections um, as a whole, um, two things to note. Um, number one, uh, most common uh, probably cause of respiratory tract infection, uh, more common probably than bacterial or fungus, that's for sure. Uh, but uncommon uh, to have any lung findings um, in most um, immunocompetent individuals. Uh, 
Reason is, uh, most of the time, these respiratory tract infections are confined to the upper respiratory tract. Um, as a consequence, if you ask what's the most common imaging feature of a viral respiratory tract infection, um, it's probably just airway wall thickening, if anything. Um, but uh, if you're talking about um, other um, potential manifestations, yes, one of the manifestations of um, viral infections um, are non-diffuse consolidation, which is why it's on our list today. So here's an example, multifocal, um, uh, non-diffuse um, consolidation on a test x-ray and on a chest CT. So uh, we always have to think about viral infections as a potential explanation for uh, non-diffuse acute consolidation. Bacterial infections. Um, most of the ones on the list here, both our ordinary and our mycobacterial um, 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 infections, um, can potentially cause acute non-diffuse consolidation. Um, as radiologists, um, sometimes we may uh, divide these uh, infections a little slightly differently than just purely by um, genus and species and stuff uh, into aspiration, community acquired, and mycobacteria. But um, long story short, um, lots of bacterial causes um, um, can cause um, acute non-diffuse consolidation presentation. Um, when it comes to um, imaging, it turns out that Basically, imaging is not all that specific in terms of identifying one um, type of bacterial infection from another. Uh, one, uh, that's what's going on. Uh, what are the imaging features when you do see a bacterial lung infection that's resulting in uh, acute non-diffuse consolidation? You see some of the findings that we've listed here under common features. Um, some uh, cases uh, may potentially cavitate, but fortunately it's not um, a common um, feature. Um, and uh, on the subject of cavitation, I just wanted to point out that it's important not to overcall cavitation in the setting of um, uh, consolidative lung infections. Um, oftentimes, uh, when you have consolidative lung infections superimposed upon emphysematous lung, some of the emphysematous um, spaces, which are not filled by um, fluid, may give off the appearance of cavitation, where it's just basically um, emphysematous lung that just didn't get consolidated within the uh, consolidative area. A few more other comments about uh, bacterial lung infections as causes of uh, acute non-diffuse consolidation. Um, you know, uh, I think we, we understand that uh, uh, majority of community-acquired pneumonias are bacterial. Uh, and another uh, comment, uh, hospital-acquired and ventilator-associated pneumonias uh, um, sometimes are tough to, to diagnose, uh, most often because there's perhaps uh, other confounding pictures, which will result in a slightly less uh, uh, simple, if you will, um, appearance on imaging. Um, when we deal with, um, uh, you know, entertaining uh, bacterial uh, infections as the explanation for our acute non-diffuse consolidation, uh, we have to be a little bit careful because it turns out that sometimes uh, there are things that can mimic the look of uh, consolidative bacterial uh, infection. Um, camouflage lung cancer. Um, cases of lung cancer, especially if there's some post-obstructive pneumonia because you've knocked off an airway. Um, can look kind of like um, um, a focal um, community acquired pneumonia sometimes. Um, other malignancies, um, certain subtypes of adenocarcinoma and pulmonary lymphoma can look a lot like your um, common um, um, bacterial uh, pneumonia. And so as a consequence, um, when we're dealing with um, uh, situations where we think we're like, well, we're seeing a bacterial lung infection uh, resulting in consolidative um, non-diffuse consolidation, we'll usually want to see to make sure that this uh, opacity goes away after the patient's been treated and that we're not being fooled by cancer or some other thing. Um, so it's not unusual to get some sort of follow-up imaging, a CT scan in three months or maybe a chest x-ray in two months. And so just a few examples of images to throw up here for you. So this is a uh, aspiration pneumonia. Um, here's a case of staph pneumonia. And uh, this goes back to the point we discussed a few slides ago. You might see a little few... Uh, so areas of lucency within this consolidation of the right lung, that is not cavitation. That's just areas of emphysema um, that haven't been filled with fluid. Um, here's an example of acute TB, active TB. Um, so um, one thing to throw out there is, um, you know, uh, on our list of um, bacterial agents, uh, mycobacterial uh, um, 
um, kind of infections generally don't result in consolidation. Um, however, in immunosuppressed individuals, um, they sometimes can, which is why uh, when you look at the uh, kind, of, uh, kind of species we need to consider, uh, not only are our common uh, new, uh, community acquired pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia candidates um, in our differential, but so is TB and non-tubercular mycobacteria, uh, because in immunosuppressed people, they can present as uh, non-diffuse uh, consolidation. All right, so we've knocked off virus, we've knocked off bacteria, uh, finally fungus. So um, there are basically a few endemic fungal um, uh, fungi which can potentially manifest as acute non-diffuse consolidation, histococci and blasto. Um, they're more likely to manifest as nodules, uh, but in uh, immunosuppressed individuals, sometimes these guys can manifest as non-diffuse consolidation. Um, diagnosing endemic fungal infections does require you to have a familiarity with what the distribution of these um, endemic fungi are. So um, you know, you have to make sure that uh, your patient is from an area that um, this would be an appropriate uh, differential diagnosis. And so uh, here's an example of uh, uh, non-diffuse consolidation uh, in a uh, immunosuppressed individual with histoplasmosis. All right, so to summarize, um, um, when we talk about acute non-diffuse consolidation, uh, we have to consider lung infections. And um, what do we need to think about? We need to think about viral, bacterial, and endemic fungal infections um, uh, in our differential diagnosis. Um, if this is the whole panoply um, of potential uh, respiratory tract infections, uh, we kind of remind ourselves earlier that uh, aspergillus and septic emboli are excluded. Those do, do not present um, as uh, a consolidation. And pneumocystis is off the list uh, because it presents, if it presents as consolidation, as diffuse consolidation. And then uh, just a reminder for these three asterisks, TB, uh, non-tubercular mycobacterial and endemic fungal, uh, these are things we'll consider um, if the patient's immunosuppressed. So for immunocompetent people, uh, if, I, if I'm thinking about a, a lung infection as a cause for my acute non-diffuse consolidation, I'm thinking viral, community-acquired, uh, and aspiration volume. So that fills in the first three things that we want you to remember for a lung infection. Um, remember, could it be viral? Could it be bacterial? Could it be fungal? All right, when it comes to pulmonary edema, what are the three things we uh, want you guys to remember? Well, let's start um, by having a conversation about cardiogenic pulmonary edema, CHF. Um, this can actually be um, a, one of the reasons you can have uh, acute non-diffuse consolidation, um, in this case uh, resulting in a non-diffuse pattern of pulmonary edema, alveolar pulmonary edema. So if we take the circulatory system and uh, think about a patient who has left heart failure, um, these are some of the reasons. What happens? Well, uh, if the left heart pump is not able to push as much fluid through as it should, um, obviously uh, forward flow decreases. And there's a sl effectively a kind of a backup of fluid upstream of that left heart pump. And that fluid's going to eventually um, back up into the lungs. Uh, what happens uh, at that, uh, when that happens? Well, a sequence of events will happen. The pulmonary veins, which um, are not going to be totally um, kind of distended in a normal state, um, they have a capacitance to accept a little bit more backup fluid. And so the first thing that will happen when a patient goes into uh, left heart failure is um, those pulmonary uh, veins will um, swell up to take a little bit of this excess um, volume of fluid that's kind of backing up. Uh, we'll, con we'll call this con uh, pulmonary venous congestion in conversation. Now, if the failure con uh, continues, the capacitance of the pulmonary venous system to absorb that extra fluid eventually um, gives way. And something's going to happen at the secondary pulmonary lobular level. So these pulmonary veins become distended. Um, so they got to take up some of that excess um, backed up fluid, but there's a certain um, um, limit to how much they can uh, accept. And next thing happens is uh, water begins to pool within the interlobular septi, uh, which the pulmonary veins drain. Um, these interlobular septi also have a, a, a you know, a, a certain amount of finite uh, ability to absorb um, this backed up fluid. And as it does that, the walls become thicker. Uh, this results in what we refer to as interlobular septal thickening uh, that's sometimes visible on CT imaging. 
or curly B lines uh, when we see this on a chest X-ray. Eventually, the capacity of the interlobular septi to absorb whatever fluid's backing up because of poor um, left heart pump um, uh, function, uh, so that eventually capacity um, uh, becomes um, basically, uh, uh, re we reach capacity. And then fluid begins to, at that point, start spilling within the alveolar spaces. Um, first, with the, uh, first, you're going to see it perhaps around the intralobular interstitium, um, eventually filling up those airspaces partially. Uh, we'll see this as ground glass opacities. Basically, uh, in airspace opacity, we can still kind of see through. Um, and eventually, uh, uh, the um, airspaces will completely be filled by fluid and result in consolidation. Um, and this is what results uh, you know, in the kind of con conventional bat wing diffuse consolidative appearance that uh, sometimes we encounter in folks with uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now, this is a talk about non-diffuse consolidation. Um, so why are we talking about this? Well, it turns out when you take a symmetric process like um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, CHF, and say superimpose it upon um, heterogeneous lung, say an area uh, a lung that has um, heterogeneous, uh, perhaps even bullous emphysema in some spots and not others, um, this seemingly symmetric diffuse process takes on a non-diffuse appearance. And so um, we may end up with something like this. And so we don't want to uh, box us into a corner and just think this can only be a uh, multifocal lung infection. It could still be um, symmetric pulmonary edema superimposed upon non-symmetric lung. And so, um, this is why uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema is going to be one of the three things we want you to remember when considering pulmonary edema as a cause of uh, non-diffuse consolidation. Um, that heterogeneity uh, of lung, uh, emphysema in this case, uh, could be one reason. Um, decubitus positioning is another. Um, folks who may uh, preferentially spend much of their time on one side may have um, an asymmetric um, distribution of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And then, of course, um, as you may have um, kind of learned in the past, um, certain valvular, cardiac valvular disease may predispose to a more um, asymmetric distribution of uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And the asymmetry can be quite striking at times. So here are some examples. Um, these are certainly not uh, diffuse symmetric consolidation cases, um, but these are cases of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. All right, so that's one of the things for uh, pulmonary edema we need to think about. Uh, what are the other two things uh, we want you to remember when we talk about pulmonary edema as a cause of non-diffuse consolidation? Well, aspiration pneumonitis is the next one. With aspiration pneumonitis, um, a patient inhales acid, um, in this case from gastric juices um, because of an aspiration event, and that acid um, irritates um, um, the really, really subtle um, kind of uh, lighting um, of, you know, that alveolar tissue, especially at the capillary level and results in the capillaries um, beginning to leak a little bit of water. Um, capillary leak edema is what uh, folks refer to this as. And this eventually um, may result in a ground glass opacity as air is slowly replaced by fluid and eventually consolidation. And here's an example of a patient with some consolidations, but heterogeneous. Um, but in this case, the cause was not uh, one of the three categories of lung infection, and it was not um, asymmetric cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This was a case of aspiration pneumonitis um, that when they aspirated during a procedure. Um, this, cap this focal capillary leak pulmonary edema due to chemical, um, in this case, um, acid exposure. The last thing we want you to think about, uh, we've talked about um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. We've talked about aspiration pneumonitis as causes of um, uh, non-diffuse uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, the last thing we want you to think about is uh, entity um, acute lung injury. Um, there are other things that can cause capillary leak pulmonary edema that can irritate the lung that causes capillary leak edema, uh, ranging from the immunological, uh, the immune response to an infection or trolley transfusion related acute lung injury to chemical exposures, whether uh, from the bloodstream, um, from drug toxicity, whether that's a legal drug like chemotherapy or perhaps illicit drug uh, like crack. Um, chemical fume um, inhalation, vaping exposure, um, all other things to consider besides um, just acid, ex um, you know, from the um, stomach um, that can play out um, in a process resembling aspiration pneumonitis, um, but resulting in 
same kind of issue of capital edema leading to ground glass opacities and consolidation. Um, and here's an example for you. This is non-diffuse, lower lung predominant um, consolidation, uh, not due to lung infection, but due to pulmonary edema. And the source of this pulmonary edema is acute lung injury uh, secondary to transfusion. Here's another example of non-diffuse consolidation in this case uh, due to pulmonary edema caused by lung injury from a drug, in this case, methotrexate. So the three things we want you to consider when you're entertaining pulmonary edema as your cause of a non-diffuse acute consolidation are, could this be cardiogenic edema playing out heterogeneously? Could this be aspiration pneumonitis? Or could this be an acute lung injury? And then you have to think about all the potential things that might irritate the lung. Finally, alveolar hemorrhage. Let's break this down. Alveolar hemorrhage can be um, a cause of acute non-diffuse uh, consolidation. Um, from a clinical perspective, hemoptysis is, all, is not necessarily all that helpful. Uh, why? Uh, it turns out that you're going to see plenty of patients who have alveolar hemorrhage but no hemoptysis. And you're going to see plenty of patients with hemoptysis, but no alveolar hemorrhage. So um, if you're trying to find something to hang your hat on that's at least remotely specific, hemoptysis may not be that thing. Uh, in, in the end, it turns out that clinical history and sometimes um, imaging features may be more specific than uh, hemoptysis in terms of uh, deciding if we're dealing with uh, alveolar hemorrhage or not. So what are the... Um, three things we want you to remember uh, when you're entertaining alveolar hemorrhage as the cause of acute non-diffuse consolidation? Well, first um, kind of number one is, could this be a systemic hemorrhagic disorder that's also playing out in the lungs in such a way that you're getting some non-diffuse hemorrhage? Um, in, if you're considering this, you have to think about what are your main categories of systemic hemorrhagic disorder and does it fit with the clinical picture you're looking at? So generally, when I'm entertaining systemic hemorrhagic disorders, um, there are basically four subsets of patients um, I would kind of think about. Is this a previously healthy outpatient with no other medical issues? In this case, uh, could we be seeing a pulmonary renal syndrome manifest for the first time? If you're dealing with a patient with lymphoma or leukemia, um, some sort of platelet um, dyscrasia is um, you know, at the top of my mind. If my patient has a known bleeding disorder, that's going to be the first thing I'm going to be thinking of as the cause. If it's if I'm entertaining a systemic hemorrhagic disorder playing out as uh, non-diffuse alveolar hemorrhage in the lungs. And finally, if my patient's on anticoagulation, could they be um, um, super therapeutic? Um, example, here's an example of alveolar hemorrhage playing out as heterogeneous consolidation, um, non-diffuse. All right, what's another reason to encounter non-diffuse hemorrhage um, in the lung uh, resulting in... Uh, uh, consolidation. Um, well, pulmonary infarct is another one. Um, sometimes people with um, PEs may develop a pulmonary infarct, and that may look like heterogeneous consolidation in a non-diffuse distribution. Turns out that uh, pulmonary infarcts are not not super common with PEs. Um, one estimate is that maybe 10% of PEs may lead to an infarct. So there are going to be many times you're going to see a PE um, on a study and not see an infarct. Um, when it happens, it tends to happen in the setting of a very peripheral PE uh, in a patient who has some underlying uh, morbidity. Now, um, as we said, uh, most PE patients, there is usually no uh, lung parenchymal finding that we're going to pick up, but in a small number who have an infarct, we may see um, a heterogeneous area of consolidation in a non-diffuse distribution that often tends to be cone or wedge-shaped. And here's an example in the uh, posterior right lower lobe in one patient and in the uh, lingula in another patient. Uh, here's the coronal and the sagittal view of that. So pulmonary infarct. Third thing I want you to remember when you're considering alveolar hemorrhage as a cause of acute non-diffuse consolidation is a pulmonary contusion. Um, could you be dealing with um, basically bruising um, within the lung, frank lung? Um, how, do, how does contusion occur? It occurs when these small vessels um, within lung parenchyma are disrupted um, by some sort of traumatic event and blood begins to um, leak into the alveolar spaces.
That's what contusion is. Uh, generally, there's no macroscopic level to disruption of the parenchyma. If there were, uh, you'd be seeing a different finding. Uh, you'd be seeing a pulmonary laceration or a hematoma, which is going to look different than um, just a patchy consolidation much of the time. And we'll get to that in our trauma um, talk. Um, a few notes about pulmonary contusion um, generally happens pretty quickly after the trauma event. Um, and uh, because uh, usually the patients uh, traumatize outside of the hospital and they come to you um, and they develop relatively quickly, um, if you have a chest x-ray in the trauma bay that's clear and then a chest x-ray that shows acute consolidation afterwards, it's a little less likely um, for it to be contusion most of the time because it probably should have already been on the initial first chest x-ray, not have developed on a subsequent one an hour or two later. Um, generally, um, they tend to be most extensive on your initial chest x-ray and regress um, um, over the next uh, one or two weeks. Um, the imaging features of uh, pulmonary con uh, contusion, uh, well, non-diffuse consolidation, obviously. Uh, they tend to be peripheral. They tend to be focal. Um, lung doesn't tend to be distorted. Um, these are relatively acute phenomena that don't really distort and scar the lung or anything immediately. Um, tough to tell apart from pneumonia. Um, but um, pay attention to signs of uh, superficial trauma to that area of lung. Are there rib fractures nearby, or hematoma, for example? And pay attention to the other side of the chest, coup contra coup. Um, we mentioned uh, this last slide just to kind of uh, remind ourselves that, you know, not every uh, non-diffuse consolidation uh, case in a trauma patient is going to be contusion. Uh, atelectasis on a chest x-ray can sometimes look a lot like a non-consolidation. Uh, um, aspiration pneumonitis can look like non-diffuse consolidation. Sometimes people do aspirate in the trauma bay. Um, and if you're dealing with a trauma patient a few days out, um, you know, trauma patients sometimes um, have not quite normal respiration and um, can develop pneumonias. And so the differential diagnosis is there, even trauma patients. Um, uh, it's not, not every non-diffuse consolidation in a trauma patient is going to be a contusion. Um, here's one example of contusion um, I, could, I found in my library, so I want to show you uh, posterior left lower lobe. So, um, if we're entertaining alveolar hemorrhage as a cause of acute non-diffuse consolidation, think about systemic hemorrhagic disorders, pulmonary infarcts, pulmonary contusion. And there you have it. Um, instead of just blood, water, pus, uh, we're going to ask you to remember three things for each of these three um, categories um, going forward now. Uh, if you see an acute non-diffuse consolidation, could it be a viral pneumonia? Could it be bacterial pneumonia? Even TB or non-tubercular mycobacterial infection if the patient is immunosuppressed. Could it be an endemic fungal infection if the patient is immunosuppressed? Could I be dealing with cardiogenic pulmonary edema superimposed upon heterogeneously emphysematous lung or a patient who likes to uh, remain in a decubitus position? Could this be aspiration pneumonitis? Probably might be more lower lobe predominant. Could I be dealing with acute lung injury um, due to Lots of other things, transfusion, uh, drugs, etc. Could I be dealing with a hemorrhagic systemic um, process playing out involving the lungs in a non-diffuse way? Am I looking at a pulmonary infarct or a pulmonary contusion, especially in a trauma patient where there's signs that support this? Um, one last thing, if I'm looking at a chest x-ray, as we discussed in the atelectasis talk, Sometimes sublobar atelectasis is really tough to tell apart from focal consolidation. Am I dealing with sublobar atelectasis? There you go. That's the distribution. Um, that's um, of diseases that we have to kind of consider when we encounter acute non-diffuse consolidation.